the next speaker is Sharad Ramanathan here from Harvard and these two different departments, molecular cell biology and engineering applied physics. And one is setting up. Um, <clears throat> so his background is, as far as I learned, theoretical physics, is that correct? Vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but looking at cellular decision processes. So the talk is about stochasticity human development. So, so my talk is going to be much more messy than the previous one. The previous one was pure for messy stuff. Uh, and I changed the title of my talk after talking to one of the organizers, thankfully it's for me. And I thought, okay, I should talk about more stochasticity, and I'll tell you about non-subtle bits about more. So we study primarily human embryonic stem cells and human fetal tissue development. And lately we've been focusing on the early embryonic development. All of you start off as a single sheet of cells. Uh, and at some point, the sheet will tear. You'll undergo gas relation and so you make a torus from a sphere. Uh, and at this tear, you start generating cell types that belong inside you, so muscle, bone, gut. And away from the tear, you generate cell types that belong outside, skin, neuron. So if you remember, neurons are on the outside and the skin folds over. Um, so there are some number of, since I don't know if most of you are interested in names of proteins and signals, I've omitted all of them. But <laughs> well, any time you want three letter names, that make sense to you. So let's do a non-subtle experiment. Take human embryonic stem cells that are a single sheet and dump signal on them. Like you're just taking a fire hose to them and just dumping signal on them. And once you've done this, you look at the cells and see what they've become. Okay? And we're just dumping signals that make cells become the inside of you. Picture looks like that. I don't know if you can appreciate the color of the lights, but there are a whole bunch of cell types, all kinds of stuff happens. So even though the spatial profile of the signal is completely uniform, You've dumped a hell of a lot of signal on this setup. You get all kinds of cell types. Uh, so, but it seems like in the middle you have sure. More, but there's certainly structure. Right. Yeah. So there is structure, and I'm going to get rid of the structure in a bit. Uh, but you see all sorts of stuff. So, question is, what is happening here? And understanding what's happening here is important for two reasons. If we understand what's happening here, we actually do understand something about early human development or early mammalian development, as I'll tell you in a second. And second, if you really want to do medical useful stuff, you want to make sure they all become the same thing. Okay. So the model of the story is very simple, almost trivial, space and time matter. Um, so I'll mostly talk about time, but I'll just get rid of space first. Thanks to your question, maybe you're okay. uh, So this is us. This yellow sheet of cells are the epiblasts. They're a single layer of cells. They're actually a watertight junction. They're watertight. So these black connections between the cells are ecoderm junctions, and nothing can go through. And the single sheet here is going to become all of you. All of this is extra embryonic stuff that's providing signals, it becomes placenta, it becomes supporting tissue. You can take human embryonic stem cells and grow them in a dish. The conditions under which you grow them are exceptionally controlled. It's not some broth, but just two inhibitors of two signaling pathways, and you can keep the cells to a potent. This is an image, a confocal stack, maybe I should turn some lights on, uh, of the that works, that's better, uh, of these cells. So the white that you see are the watertight junctions. So exactly in the embryo, in a dish, you form watertight junctions, the blue are nuclei, and I'll come to the red. So to get rid of space, particularly since some of this is published, let's just go to the question. I dump signal on them uniformly. Why do I see spatial structure? That too, when I've dumped so much signal that they should all be completely overwhelmed by what I added to the system. Turns out, and this is basic biology that we found, we're adding signal. Remember, it's a watertight surface. We're adding signal here. The fish is here. All the receptors that listen to the signal are on the bottom. <laughs> so most of the cells in the middle don't see the signal we're adding. These are confocal stacks just rotated. The reds are the receptor. You see all of the receptors that receive the signal are below the watertight junction. 
So adding signal uniformly to the top doesn't mean that you've added signal uniformly at all. And it turns out, we've done this in the mouse embryo too, same thing happens. All of the receptors are on the basal side, and they contain a very specific amino acid motif, which is conserved in all TGF beta BMP receptors in all species. We can mutate the receptor, the, this amino acid sequence, and flip the receptor, and we can make cells respond. But the basic point with space is that even if you add signals uniformly on the top, signals have to go around the cells, around the boundary to reach the receptor. And between the base and the cells, you're getting some kind of gradient. And so you see spatial structure. Okay. Uh, so let's get rid of space. Yeah? You keep using the word dump. Am I supposed to think you put a lot of yeah, signal? Yeah, yeah. You add five times, 10 times on a log scale. You keep adding signal. You see all sorts of cell types from the top. Uh, so now we can add signal from the bottom. So what's the mechanism uh, of motion or transport of this signal? It's diffusion or it's, what In this it? case, it's diffusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the mouse embryo too, we start off as a sheet. The mouse embryo starts as a cup. And all the receptors we found are facing away on the outside of the cup. And there is extra embryonic tissue <coughs> as an envelope around the cup. To reach the receptors, the signal has to crawl between two tissues to get there. So even if signal is uniform, there is a little gap through which the gradient forms. So uh, I wanted to move on and tell you about get rid of space. So how do I get rid of space? Grow the cells on a membrane, add signal from below. So then you should start reducing stochasticity and get rid of all these crappy effects. Before I go ahead, just brief introduction. These yellow cells that you saw, I've changed color on you, colored on green. Those are human embryonic stem cells. Those cells can make anything that is in your body. Those cells initially have only two options. One is to become mesenderm. As I said, those are the inside of you. Other is to become ectoderm, outside of you. So yellow outside, inside, blue outside, inside, uh, outside, inside, outside. So green to yellow, green to blue. And there are very specific signals that drive you one way or the other. And the image I showed you last time with all these colors have all of these cell types and the cells have even gone further. So now, let's try to see if I can make the system respond homogeneously if I add signal from the bottom so that all of the cells can see the signal. So here, I can make them respond uniformly. I take stem cells, I open the gates. As soon as I open the gates, the cells, by default, if I don't add any signal, become neurons. Not only do they become neurons, they're going to all become forebrain neurons giving rise to cortical neurons. So that's sort of the default fate. Don't add any signal, just feed them, they'll go there. Now, I open the gates, and I add signal right away. Right? So they're differentiating. They're supposed to be going down this way. I add signal. They all turn SOX 17 or for SOX 2. So you see the yellow color is here. Blue color is gone. I can get rid of stochasticity completely and make everybody turn yellow if I add the signal from below. But now comes the complication. I open the gates, don't add signal right away, just add the signal three days after opening the gates. Cell cycle is one day huh? in these cells. So two or three cell cycles, this is already dramatic. Same thing happens if I add it one day after, where it's gone through one cell division. Cells are no longer yellow. They're yellow and blue, or rather yellow or blue. You see a biomole distribution. So when I add the signal, after one cell cycle, the same signal, some of the cells go this way, some of the cells go that way. They've already gone through a cell cycle in the dish? Yeah. 24 hours, they're all going, 24 hours of the cell cycle. Uh, but before your time zero, as it were, time one. They're dividing. So they're not synchronized cells, so they're just dividing happily. You suddenly open the gates to move these two inhibitors. They start marching towards neuro. You immediately add the signal, they all turn right and go inside of your body instead of becoming outside. You wait one cell cycle time, some fraction will keep going, even though you've added signal, some other fraction will so turn it's, right. So it's one cell cycle time after taking away the inhibitor. Exactly, exactly. So this is time after taking away the inhibitor. 
and you wait six days, everybody comes through. So you get a bimodal distribution where some cells, even when you add signal, do not keep going, do not turn to where you tell them to turn, they keep going straight. And the fraction of cells that do not turn towards the yellow decreases as you wait longer. All of these cells you've shown can listen to signal, by the way, they have no problem listening to the signal. The program they execute every day later is different. This is so dramatic that here is the system. Take cells, add, take the gates off, add signal right away, everybody will become mass of unborn. Wait a couple days, add signal, some of them will become muscle unborn, some of them will become skin, not neurons. Wait another two days, add the same signal, one day is one cell cycle, all of them will become some kind of neuron. So the same signal added at different times during the course of development gives rise to dramatically different tissue types. What is the mechanical stress of this kind of tissue over time? Is it increasing or is the tissue deforming over Why do you time? Ask? Huh? Why do you ask? I was just wondering if mechanical feedback can trigger this differentiation. It's just a matter of waiting that the tissue deforms. Uh, no, no, no. I, I ask that question not frequently, but because I have some amount of literature in my head and I'm just trying to see what I need to unload on you. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but the point is this, okay? There has been some work on mechanical feedback into differentiation. This has been primarily related to the wind pathway. And it seems like different stiffnesses give you different tissue types. We've actually shown that it's not mechanics, it's the hydrophobicity of the surface that matters. So we do not see any involvement of mechanics here. Mm. And now we can show. Mm. So there is no, no, no mechanics. Even though there are papers saying there are mechanics, what happens is that the ligand that's secreted is lipid modified. People are using PDMS for their substrates. The lipids get stuck to the substrate. And so then you get things which seem like, oh, I changed the mechanics by changing PDMS. But what you've done is allowed the sticky light and mm -hmm. stick to the surface. Okay. So here there is no mechanics. I don't know if you want more detail. Right? Okay. So space matters, time matters. And so then you can see that the problem gets dirty. If I am a cell here, inside the colony, I start marching towards becoming the outside of the body. So inside of the colony becomes outside of the body. Signals have to come around the bottom to reach me. In the meanwhile, I'm happily marching along where I think I should be going until I see the signal. Depending on when I see the signal, my competence to become different things changes. So this coupling between how spatial diffusion happens, what the time scale of the diffusion is, and what the context of the cell inside the cell is, are both changing simultaneously. And so patterning can be exceptionally complicated. Yeah. But you had on your slide that you should, again, coming back to Eduardo's point, there seems to be some clustering. It's not a salt and pepper uh, distribution of blue and yellow. Yes. In the intermediate yes. states, yes. it's, it's yeah. clumps of yellow. Absolutely. So is that suggestive of uh, interactions between the cells that are... There is certainly something to do with locality. density dependence and secretion of inhibitors on top of all of this. So these cells are also secreting antiparticles mm -hmm. you like for the particles you're adding, and you're sort of trying to inhibit the signal. So there's spatial structure on top of all of this, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, we tried like single cell single cell RNA sequencing at these different time points. I'll come. come You've done both with mouse and human embryos. I'm coming to that. Mm. Are you going to tell us why the second is true, or is this just something we take for? Uh, why I showed you it was true. I've shown you yeah, that yeah. it is true, I'm and I will try and tell you we I think know. we know why it is true now, but not too much because I don't want to give you lots of details. So I'll give you some flavor and then catch me after and I can go into all of the details. So why does time matter? Can we decrease the stochasticity in time? Can I add signals at any time I want and still get all the cells to turn yellow? Right? So how do I control this time dependence of the response is the question. Um, is there anything else you want to tell you here? I can answer. Okay, so the problem in 
understanding how this mechanism happens, what is happening here is a follow-up. You start cells here, and you add signal, right? The problem is that you have to wait a while before you figure out whether they decided to become yellow or blue. It takes some time. You add the signal, and if you look at classical biology literature, you have to wait two days before you know what the cell decided to do. So by the time you know what it decided to do, it's two days after the decision was first made. So the problem is, what was different in the starting cell that made it decide different things has been hard to get. And this is because the experiment itself is sort of tedious. You don't know what it decided till it decided, but then it's too late. So then we turn to single cell sequencing, and I won't go into any of the details here. Oh, so here. So you add signal, wait for two days before markers show up. You cannot assay the cells at the point of audition because you don't know what they're going to do. So then you don't know what to do. Right? So if somehow, as the cells are walking down this road, you could start telling me what is the cell thinking of doing? What is it capable of doing? If I could predict even before adding the signal, that would be useful. Because if I could predict accurately, I can then capture the cells and say, do you, do you think you're doing this? Do you think you're doing something else? I'm going to keep, grab both of you to molecular, whatever phenotyping to uh, infinite and beyond, and then try to get the maximum. Right? So <clears throat> what you need, if you're a chemist, something like an order of the reaction coordinate. If you're a physicist, something like an order parameter. And an order parameter is more accurate because you actually want something you can measure with numbers as opposed to just an arrow. And so you want to find single cell gene expression data. From this data, you want to ask, which genes can I measure in real time so that I can read the mind of the cell and predict what the cell is going to do upon signal addition, right? So not only do you want a low dimensional representation of the single cell data, but PCA components aren't going to do it for you because with fluorescent reporters, you can tag two genes. So you want gene one, gene two, color them, and use these colors to predict what the cell is going to do. Turns out, and this is all published, we can do it repeatedly, and I can tell you which genes to measure all the way to particle development, and I can tell you at every bifurcation what the cell is going to do. And I'll show you the movie for this particular decision there. I can tell you in real time, just by measuring the color of red and green, what the cell is thinking of doing by coloring red genes. So I can tell you, as before adding signal, when I add signal, is it going to become inside or outside? And I can tell you precisely which genes to color, and this I can read for half of the talk, perhaps. So we can color the cells. And so we can tell you two-dimensional face plots. Cell is going this way, cell is going that way. I can sort it out. In this particular case, the coordinate system is simple. It just turns out to be SOX4 and SOX2 for this bifurcation. And every bifurcation, there are a different set of genes. The trajectory I showed you in this two-dimensional phase plot is exactly like this. It starts green. This is real data, by the way. It looks like it's colored, crayon colors, but there are actually tax contours. It goes to this purple region. In this purple region, it either goes yellow, that's the yellow, or it goes blue. Inside this purple region is the mess. The question is, what is the cell thinking of doing? That's all happening here. So that's under inhibition? That's with the gates closed? No, this is with the gates closed. So open the gates, they go there, and then split in this two-dimensional <coughs> phase plot. But in this two-dimensional phase plot, this is where the mess has happened. If I could look at this cloud and say which part cannot turn left, which part is going to go straight, and if I can sort these cells, then I can start asking for mechanism as to why this is happening. It turns out that we can precisely just sort this. So here, if I just take this yellow cloud, purple cloud and add the signal, this is what I'll get, just for reference. This is back to the original image. Yeah. So, can you represent time on that? I don't think time is as important as the location. So we can show uh, that it's not absolute time, but just the location on this phase plot, I can tell you precisely what the cell is thinking of. And the reason you're seeing stochasticity is because the cells are distributed in this cloud. So hold on a second. Okay. We can take this purple cloud and break it up into two pieces. I'm going to call pre and post. Let me sort the pre cells out. Those are the cells, when I add signals, will still be able to turn yellow. I'm going to take them out, add signal, wait two days, and look at their color. And here's the answer yellow. All of them. 
with a few exceptions from fact sorting we can show. Take those cells, add signal, all blue. So right here, I can tell you if I draw a line and separate those ones versus those ones, and these are closer by than one cell cycle apart, so we can really catch them. So I can tell you what's the difference between these two. I can predict before adding the signal what they're going to become. So now I can do my experiment, which you ask, what is the molecular reason for this difference? And we've actually sorted cells on either side. We've done RNA-seq again on these cells. We've done attack-seq on these cells. Done horrible bioinformatics seq data analysis, which I really cringe when I see slides on. But uh, we can do that too. And we can tell you what genes are that are making the doors open and close, because somewhere here, the door has closed. You can't turn left anymore. Right. Not only can we do that, now we can identify the genes, and I won't bore you with data. Here's what's happening. Cells are here. They're marching down. There is a window up to which, when you add the signal, they can turn left and go there. After a point, the window closes, and they keep going down and turn blue. Some of the cells can, not all of them. No, if we sort by the window, all of the cells can. Oh, if you sort. Yeah, so we can sort on either side of the window, okay. all of the cells. So, yeah. So it's completely location dependent based on the arc score and such. Yeah. So, so then, then it's, it's like writing, uh, having multiple steady states, which each which has a base of attraction. It's so depends on the steady state, state or not. We can just sort, they're all moving. So we have, I don't have time traces here, but they're all sort of flowing along happily. So I don't know if it's a steady state of any sort. Why is there a spatial structure if they're, you know, if they're all kind spatial of... Spatial structure, I, it's a separate story. So there's certainly cell division during this time, but there is also cell-cell communication during this time. And that I'm not talking about. So the point is I can change the fraction of the structure. Spatial structure, separate. That's a very interesting question again. And there is beautiful self-organized spatial structure in all of these dishes. I mean, you saw amazing correlations even in the first image, right? It's not salt and pepper at all, as you pointed out. Now, can you go back one more step? Sure. No, no, sorry. No. In this diagram, can you predict which ones of the stem cells will become pre and post, or is that not possible? So the point is there, it's time that's important. Cells are going from here, flowing through here, and going there. If I catch them early enough, if you remember yeah. the first slide, I can make all of them turn yellow. Yes. And the reason is that they've just started getting into the pre-region. And then I can push them all down here. Is that because they're moving more quickly or because they were already further along the, the line? Uh, they're not moving more quickly. They are just sort of, so once you, so I should have gotten the time series data. But the point is that once you open the gate, you can't tell. But then the trajectory sort out and you can see cells moving there, some cells moving more slowly. There again, there is spatial structure. And spatial structure, I don't know what to say anything about it. So, so what is this implying about SOX2 or SOX2 OP4 regulation of the individual cell? Because it's sort of suggesting that these, uh, in an individual cell, if we would have watched SOX2 uh, and OP4, yeah. what we would be seeing is a rather complicated dynamics as yes. they march through your the face, space, face yeah. right? Yeah. And um, the fact that different cells are ultimately having different fates is partly related, is it not, to the stochasticity of those Good dynamics? Question. So let me actually not answer that question okay. <laughs> and instead answer a question you would ask. Okay. Since this is almost, yeah, it is November, it's time to do that. Um, so, sorry, there's a sort of parallel dialogue running in my head, a sort of election somehow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I want to do is a follow-up which we can do. I want the cells to go there, and I still want them to be able to turn. So independent of off force of dynamics, we can make them progress further along the reaction coordinate, if you like, and we can still make them turn and not make the window close. So independent of these factors, we've actually been able to open or close the windows. By chromatin? No, by modulating specific transcription factors about which not much is known. One of them is pk nox E2, one of them is some FOXJ1, FOXB1. So these are not pluripotency factors? These are not pluripotency factors. So there seems to be a set of factors that are getting these dynamics, 
absolutely right that op4 SOX2 dynamics that's controlling how fast things go along. Independently, there seem to be knobs for tuning the window. So we can keep the rate of differentiation the same and open or move the window. And these are known to be opt for SOX2 regulations? No, don't know. I mean, if you look at PK knobs on PubMed, there is nothing. So we just did all the RNA seq in our taxi and found a bunch of factors with binding sites and gene expression changes and looked at 50 characters, overexpressed all of them to see if we can move the window, and with three of them, we can. And if you look at the literature for, say, PK knobs, there is no mouse, no power, no nothing. So, so we don't so know the answer. What, this, the, what do those proteins do with the neurotranscription factors? They are transcription factors. They're, okay, but, but bioinformatically, even you don't know if there's some binding possible to such to... Not that we can tell. So we haven't done any mechanistic stuff, so it's still ongoing. But we can open up for the independent of the rate of transition from here to there to there. So we can get cells here to move down here. And this epigenetic factors, the problem is that they're sort of blind, right? Some factors must be taking them places to guide the epigenetic factors to go somewhere. And so we were hunting for transcription factors that do that. So uh, I've jumped way ahead of where I wanted to be, but maybe I'll break this finish. So here is a window. Cells move along, the window closes. After that, they can't turn. But how do you know that you have this window and it's not a matter of cell cycle synchronization? So you could actually have different numbers of cells at different points in the cycle, and yeah. depending on when you're actually administering the signal, yeah. they could be responding. Sorry. So we have We've done in our, I didn't want to put all sorts of data in here, but we've done lots of microscopy. All of this data is from analyzing single cell tracks of cells under the microscope on a membrane with signal ladder from below. But you're able to measure where they are in the cell cycle? We can tell you where the chromosome condenses because all of our factors are transcription factors. They're in the nucleus, and then you put an envelope breaks down, you can see the factors come up. So to that extent, we can tell you where the cell cycle is. So do you see any synchronization between those clusters no. that you're pointing out? No, no. Within the cluster? No. That's, I mean, that's sort of irritating. We wanted to see, I really wanted to see something in the cell cycle. We don't. It's sort of a touchy point. I mean, it's just, let me see if I can think of anything reasonable to say. Yeah, no, we see no, like, no correlation. But once the mother decides to go one way, the daughters decide to go the same. So there is correlation in terms of cell lineage, but not in terms of cell cycle position. So the, again, the point is that the, this window is over a few cell cycles, like one and a half cell cycles. So it's not just the mother that's making the decision going past the window, it's the mother and the daughters. So we see consistent trajectories between the mother and the daughters, but nothing related to the phase of the cell cycle as best as we can measure it. And to clarify the way we measure it, these are all nuclear factors, and we just have a YFP, RFP line, so you can see the factors in the nucleus. Nuclear membrane dissolves, so we can tell when the cell is dividing. We can't tell S phase G1, G2 accurately, but we can tell you when the nuclear envelope dissolves. Right? Because the fluorescence just fills in. So if, for every place, we know where the rough position of the cell cycle when it's going to divide, and then of course you can see the two daughters jump out. Yeah. Uh, nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So as I said, we can decrease the stochasticity in time. I just turned it around to tell you that this is the coordinate, and we can tell you that if I sort cells here versus there, the responses to signal are different. And the reason you saw this pattern of cells doing different things is because it's like a distribution function moving along. Some of the cells are on one side of the window, some are on the other, and so cells are past the closing point of the window can't respond anymore, cells that are on the other side can. Right? And there are two ways to play around with the system. One is to change the rate at which you move through this trajectory. And there, proteins like OX4, SOX2, NANO come in. So we can regulate how fast they move and keep cells competent by just holding the cells here and making them move slowly or move faster through here, in which case they lose competence. The second way we've been able to do it is to actually tune the window. So we can change proportions if these factors open the window further, these factors close the window further, even if the binding the main Yeah. 
when you said they march with different developmental rates on the previous life, did you mean because you are altering things? Or no, just, natural just naturally system? there is a variability in how fast they go. So, I mean, so in the previous plot, these are all distribution functions of cells. These are actually density plots. I mean, this is bad. I just wanted to get color, and you can't see the contours. But there is a high density here, and there is a spread. This is actual distribution functions of the cells that are obtained at these different rates. So there is variability. But then there is a line here, and the question is, when does a cell cross the line? And certainly there is cell-cell communication in terms of how many people go together. So, firstly, this stochasticity is certainly due to space. Two reasons. One, receptors are localized. But the other thing that we don't know much about, cells are certainly talking to each other. And we haven't explored that. The second is time. The same signal added even one cell cycle apart can lead to dramatically different decisions of the cells. And so there are two things that are happening. The cell is marching along. It's not that the cell is an empty canvas on which the signals paint their fate, but the internal state of the cell is changing. And as the internal state changes, its ability to respond to a signal in a particular way by a particular fate choice changes. So once I go past the window where it's closed, now the cell will become skin instead of neuron in response to the same signal. If I didn't have the signal, it would have become neuron. And certainly there is sort of time dependence, as I said. And there is at least some part we can control this time dependence with a few key factors by opening and closing the window. And you can see that there are only five signals generating most of the cell phase in your body. And they're reused over and over again. And so the context is changing as the cells march down. They can all respond to these signals, but their response in terms of fit choice is different. So you can just see this mess exploding as you go past, I mean, keep marching, at least in vitro, the distribution functions are getting broader. So that's sort of the naive picture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That should be probably a stupid question. No, no, not at all. Just when you're, you're not free. Uh, so <laughs> when you do when you do the the, cell, the facts, you're taking cells out of there, running through the machine, and putting and then, them back. And but putting them back where? That's what I want to understand. Is there? Are you putting them back in the same kind of plate? Yeah. Or, so how do you know where to put them back? I mean, you put them back together in some so way. So when it comes out of a stream in the right, machine, right. we just put them back in the plate with media. Okay. And, and separate as as plates. One separate plate. One nothing to do with anything plates. else. New media, new plate. Okay. And differentiation condition as defined. Right. We either make them turn yellow or don't make them turn. I mean, always make them turn yellow in our experiment. So we always add the signal a heck of a lot. Okay. okay. But you do plate them. Uh, plate them. Okay. Plate okay. For them. separate plates. Okay. Separate no, that's plates. Gonna... no, but it's a good okay. question. But there was no way. Yeah, because what I was going to ask was, was there any way to do a little? I mean, again, totally. I don't know what your experiment is, but but if you had any way to do tracking before you took them out, and then know which one was, but it's probably impossible, right? Yeah, I guess that's Yeah, that's hard. Because that's then hard. you would have been able to answer a little bit of this question, what do you know before? Right, right, right. Here we can only force and sort them out based on After, the yeah. boundary they are. So yeah, we can say yeah. very likely they're going to not respond to the signal and make inside yeah, of your body yeah, or not. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think there's a related question to Eduardo. Um, have you ever tried the barcode <coughs> methods that allow you to get some sort of uh, traction on, on time series for individual cells? So essentially, you think that uh, you know who the sisters are, and I guess a lot of these times the, the, the sisters are fairly similar to each other. Yeah. So you can get uh, some proxy for for the uh, for the time development. In that, in that case, you can essentially maybe even see if the decision is made before this, and it's something else that happens long before, and by the time this happens, you've already uh, committed because the two daughters are doing the same thing. Right. Um, but the point is that if we add the signal early enough, we can make all of them become yellow. And we add them late, we yes, can make all the of them become blue. Yes, the question is if cells on their own would do that decision early, or if that's just because they're overwhelmed with, with signal. So if, if you had a time series at the individual cell level, you could, it seems like you could extract a lot more information from it. I've seen people start trying it with yeah, the barcodes. So, so let me make sure I understand. So we have time series. We have, I mean, all of these are imaging data over six days or five days, as the case may be. And we are monitoring levels of two proteins. And so then in the process, point. you add signal and try to predict where they're going to go. And at the end of the time series, 
antibody stain after two days and see what they became and make sure you got your predictions right. That right. we can do. Okay, so you have that data already. So yeah, is there, um, is it something interesting I you can tell from the, comparing the two daughters? The two, there is strong bias in terms of what daughters do, or the daughters seem to do the same thing. So if you look at the, do you have, for example, do you have any rare outliers where uh, two we things do. are we uh, related historically, yeah. but in terms of your two markers, they are not so related? Yeah. And then see and they the diverge and they will make different phase. We can find these rarely, but not often. So I, mean, I think about five, seven percent of the times you see two doctors choosing different phase. If you add the signal at the right time. So we do our experiments and add the signal precisely where we expect 50 percent to go one way and 50 percent to go the other way. And that's the point where you want to do these experiments, right, to get the most craziness. Did you try doing these experiments with a completely monoclonal population of cells? These are all, yeah, I'm these are all, these are all, yeah, these are all monoclonal. Yeah, as in growing them from a single cell yeah. and then, yeah. and you're still seeing this heterogeneity. Yeah. So is this due to some uh, heterogeneity that's being selected for in the, uh, well, what is the source of this heterogeneity then? It's all from So if I just let that, I mean, I don't know what you mean by heterogeneity, but if I just let them all go, they will all turn blue eventually. Right, right. right yeah. but, but it could be something like local density. I mean, this is just a cop out <clears> answer. <throat> but it could be something like local density, local environment on, on top of it, some stochasticity. They don't all have to progress down their developmental trajectory at the same speed. And so if there is a particular line that they cross and after which their response becomes qualitatively different, it's all a matter of the statistics of what fraction of the population crosses the line, and we're doing it in the speed sweet spot where 50% is on one side and 50% is on the yes, other. Yes, but if the speed is determined entirely genetically, then you would expect that you would actually see the same speed. So the question is, if you want to quantify why that... Should it be why, why, yeah. why should it be? Why would it be just so much? I mean, if everything well, is... If, if, I, mean, cause you're, I thought that what you were saying is that you could sequence them. Yeah. You could actually determine from that certain marker that would tell you what that interval would be. Yeah. No, Which interval? Know, sorry. The interval that would determine the. Uh, essentially I can the tell you a point in this yes. phase diagram where the point of no return is. Yes. But that doesn't have anything to do with time. Okay, sure, sure. Yes. But sorry, can, sorry. Okay. Yes. But that would still be something that would be. This, that would be different from cell to cell. That would be that, And the question, the question is why? Why? If they're coming, yeah. I mean, that I don't know. I mean, I don't know. There is inherent stochasticity in the rate at which things progress down a developmental trajectory. Uh, and again, I don't know if just saying noise is a cop-out answer, if there's a mechanistic answer. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to answer the question. But yeah, I have to think. Just one final answer of a question. Given that there is such a strong spatial component in the cell fate determination, how is it possible that you can sort in the phase space where there is no more spatial aspect? Does that mean that the two signals are strongly spatially correlated? No, no, no. So to sort the cells, we take the cells off the dish, break them up in liquid, so they're all sitting as individual cells. We send it through a fax machine, yeah. and based on their color ratio, we send it one way or the other. Yeah. And we read the deposit on a plate and then add the signal. Right. But what you see there is that that what you see saw in some of the images that there's a strong spatial aspect on where they go, but if you remove them from the plate, you, lost you lose that information. Yeah. And yeah. how how does it make sense that you can still predict given that you lose that information? Unless that information goes through our reaction coordinate, which yeah. is what the case is, I think. Right. So that information resides in these two protein levels already. So the question is, is it independent information or is it coming through what we measure? And that would argue for everything coming through these factors. And when I think one, one, one is sort of several years back, yeah. that these factors are causally important as well. Right, but I think the point he is making that uh, this picture shows that the spatial distribution is part of the reaction coordinate. And with your method, you ignore that, right? That's right. your point. Wait, but no, I, I mean, I think it suggests that both coordinates recapitulate the same behavior, more or less. They code, code the, basically, okay, your wait, reaction wait. coordinates are, in fact, spatial coordinates, in a way. Uh, no. So, suppose I want to turn, I don't know, purple, and there's some color in my shirt that has to go yellowish. 
right? And I'm sitting next to Jeremy who's turning purple. And the only way I can turn purple is to first become yellowish. It's dependent on spatial coordinates, but the spatial coordinates is feeding into the gene regulatory network. The levels we're measuring are of key transcription factors that are important for the decision. So all of this, all of the influences from the outside, so one could assume that all of the influences in terms of spatial information is coming from the outside. This information has to be translated inside the cell into something. And the argument would be what we are measuring is that, is that something. So the spatial structure is reflected. I mean, what the cell is thinking of doing is certainly not independent of space. But once I measure the colors of the cell, I don't need to look at space anymore because I can tell you what it is because all that information is coming to the inside of the cell through these coordinates. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> Fine. <Perhaps laughs> stop here. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before going to the coffee break, please go upstairs for the group meeting. Right now. Right now. Yes. Right now. No like coffee that. before photo. <laughs> <laughs>